John Verveke. I'm a, a, like a perpetual student of science and cognitive science and uh, philosophy and stuff like that. So uh, the, the digital world we live in affords lovers of things to connect with people doing the thing that they love. And again, because I, I, we have such mutual friends and I, uh, yeah, I've watched all the episodes you've done with John and um, your papers are excellent. I think um, as far as the kind of topics I like, I couldn't have probably picked uh, topics that I like more than what you study because I think play is really awesome and I'm really into like uh, emotion and meaning in life. I studied cognitive science, organizational psychology. Um, and so it's a very applied mental place. And so um, and one of the things I missed about that was like, they don't really care a lot about emotions. It's much more well-being than meaning in life. And so mm. thriving and stuff isn't a high priority for org psych or even cognitive science as much. Um, and so I love the philosophical, you're kind of an, uh, a proto science existentialist really because you're doing what scientists do and what existentialists used to do by wondering about like how does play and horror relate or things like that so that's that's why i was excited to talk to you that thanks what a what a wonderful introduction um love rick and john so happy you like the talks they were some of my favorite talks um, some of my favorite interviews were with John and Rick. They're just such lovely hosts and um, very bright, of course, very bright. And um, also, uh, you know, John Verveke is one of my heroes. I was a student of his in his cognitive science class. So it's cool that we get to grow up and be colleagues now. It's pretty fun. And um, thanks for the thanks for the love of the research. Um, it's exactly what I'm interested in, too. I feel very fortunate. I don't know if everybody gets that chance to only do research on the thing that they really care about. But um, so far, I've been able to just do the things I really care about. I've just had enough um, great jobs in a row where people are hiring me to do just the thing exactly that I want to do, um, which is this, um, yeah, um, thinking about the nature of the mind and especially its relationship to well-being and play and technology and now a little bit horror and horrors turning into death reflection, which is lots of fun. Um, yeah, so uh, great to great to be here and great to be in contact, and I'd love to talk about any of it. So here's our chance just to hang out and chat. Yeah, hundred percent. I I um. So how did you come up with the idea for the paper, or how did that start? Which paper is this? The horror paper? Oh yeah, I guess uh, specifically, and I'll, I'll link this in the video too. The mm -hmm. um, surfing uncertainty with screams predictive processing aerodynamics and horror films, but really any of your work <laughs> in this, this line. Cause I know no, you've worked with other things tangentially. Yeah, um, that's good. Um, that, um, I've been working with, um, one of the preeminent horror researchers, Mark Anderson. He's at Aarhus university, um, for many years now, we, um, we hit it off right off the bat. Um, and we've influenced each other's work for a long time. And uh, Mark um, took some of our aerodynamics work and then put it put it to work, um, thinking about play, um, and and then and then and then risky play, and then sort of uh, risky play is very already very close to something like love of horror. We um, published a paper a couple of years ago called "Getting a Kick Out of Film," where we started thinking about um, yeah, like if we have this idea. We have this idea that the, the brain is a prediction engine. And then you layer on top of that, the idea that feelings are playing this meta role of informing the mind, informing the cognitive system about where, where things are working out and where they're not working out. Then you have the foundation for um, a really elegant theory of play already. That is play is always finding this this optimal slope of air reduction. I don't know if that's going too far, too fast, or if you're listening. No, this to is too great. Yeah, and I'll, I'll jump in if I think things are, and I'll, I'll definitely ask a lot of questions. Yeah, right. So we're trying to we're trying to predict what the world is like. That's what we are as systems, and we're paying attention to where we do it well and where we don't do it well, and we get rewarded when we improve. So we've got this really nice foundation for play, and um, like I said, we move from play to risky play, and then we start thinking about films as a kind of play. Um, like, why are we into films? And then um, that naturally led to thinking about horror because horror is such a great example of a kind of risky play space. 
And if I could just say one more thing, and then I won't, I won't eat, eat up all the airtime. But um, eat it uh, up. Yeah. There's a there's a puzzle here, right? Um, traditionally it was called the the um, paradox of horror. Uh, no Carol, uh, which was why is it that um, why is it that we get attracted to noxious, horrible, scary, startling, a- anxiety provoking things? Why why is that the case? Why is it the case? That when you drive past a car accident, you, you, you have to look, you kind of feel like you have to. Why is it the case when a very good friend tells you somebody close to them passed or they went through a messy divorce? The very first thing we're thinking is like, tell me all about it. I need to know the gritty details. Like, how did they die? Where did they die? What happened in the relationship exactly? Like, why are we so why are we so fascinated by that problematic landscape? And that's especially puzzling for a cognitive scientist like me because we're interested in the mind as a prediction engine. And if the mind is a prediction engine, if the brain and nervous system are prediction engines, then that means that you as a system, your modus operandi, the thing that you do first and foremost is you're trying to predict the world and then reduce the uncertainty between what you predict the world to be like and what the world actually is like. That's how you generate better and better predictions. You keep reducing that uncertainty. So if that's primarily what you are as a cognitive system, then it's very weird that we go out looking for and creating uncertainty dynamics. Like why would an uncertainty minimizing system uh, go out and generate a bunch of uncertainty? So that was the starting puzzle. So that's sort of the research trajectory and then the starting puzzle. Um, And then uh, we uh, decided to devote um, a little bit of time thinking through it. It is paradoxical. I like paradoxes a lot and like, how they probably almost always promote rational improvement when you grapple with them and yeah that's even more so than like fact learning like if you had to have Mm -hmm. two groups and one just learned facts and the other wrestled with paradox and chess and stuff like that they'd probably outperform the fact learners um quite a bit and so i I love that that this tension between it's like we want to maximize pleasure happiness um you know joy friendship all these kind of things why are we going to spend like half a billion dollars making an IMAX theater to like scare ourselves and scare our children and, and things like that? And it really, you, can, you can even push the puzzle a little. So think about this. So definitely. during COVID, during COVID, hor- you would think um, under maximum uncertainty, we should have taken, you thought, I think that the intuitive thing is, is that we would have taken refuge in media that was, um, consolidating and soothing and like you would think sort of I, I don't know intuitively I think like romantic comedy should have had a big a big jump like very yeah. fantastical you know I, La want, La La Land I want comfort and re- reality like when yeah, well, but actually what we see is um horror movies took on the biggest share of the movie market in the history of film 40 percent of it took a 40 percent um share cut and um, it was a massive, a massive leap. And not only that, but horror movies that um, that were built on pandemic-related topics, uh-huh. like for instance, Contagion, was number one on the iMovies download for the whole year. You know, for like months and months and months and months. Yeah. So that, there again, right? You think you're getting into something that hurts. Um, why is it that we're not working on self-soothing? What we do instead is we um we we look to to generate for ourselves increasing experiences of uncertainty. It's such a such a um yeah such a lovely puzzle to sort of puzzle out. Yeah, fear fear is so interesting too because I don't it's a lot of it's cultural, but a lot of it I'm sure is just kind of natural. You don't want to talk about what makes you scared, and it's like um, with strangers going like my biggest vulnerabilities are, and then you just start listing them. And going like, well, if you really want to scare me, don't forget these things or discuss <laughs> yeah. or whatever. So it's, and we hide that. Yeah, and the more like insecure you are, the more like you do kind of hide that stuff. And um, yeah, you know, going really to like the, the the locker room of the football stadium and be like, you know what scares me, guys? Our opponents. Like that's never going to like encourage morale <laughs> and things like that. Uh, that's, that's but true. Um, that's true. Um, yeah. So um, have you heard of the dark room puzzle? Have you ever heard this? In no, no, house? please. Yeah, what is the dark room puzzle? So um, early on when we were, um, when this idea was getting off the ground, one of the one of the first sort of sketch criticisms, it's not a great criticism, it's a little bit of a cartoon, 
Um, but um, it helped. It helped. Um, it helped researchers hone in on on getting the interpretation right about what we mean by the mind and the brain being a predictive system. So mm -hmm. the idea was, if 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 the brain is a prediction engine, that's the hypothesis. And so what the brain primarily is doing, what it's about, is taking everything it knows about the world, um, and we call that a generative model about how things work in the world. It uses that model in order to make apt predictions about what happens next. So it's not waiting for information from the world. Rather, it's it's proactively predicting what happens next. And then it's comparing its prediction with the real world um, and using that as a, as a training signal to update its own predictions. Um, if, if that's right, and the brain is a prediction engine, and its primary aim is to get better and better predictions, and to do that, it's always comparing its predictions against the real world, and then we call that error or whatever the difference is. And then it reduces that error by updating its predictions or by changing the world to better fit its model. So if that kind of system is aiming primarily at generating good predictions, and to do that, it has to reduce the difference, reduce the uncertainty, reduce the surprise, then why isn't it that systems like us wouldn't just go to a dark room? Why wouldn't we just love the idea of being in like a flotation chamber permanently fed with IV because those are maximally certain spaces. You're not going to find any uncertainty there. Yeah. If you were to go into a totally enclosed, dark little space, fed intravenously, um, then you wouldn't have to encounter anything that was problematic or uncertain. So why wouldn't an uncertainty minimizing machine, which is what we are, if the theory is right, and I think it is, why wouldn't we trend towards a dark, completely predictable room? Because that's not what we do. Um, I sometimes joke with grad students that sometimes you know you feel like maybe you would like to do that for a minute, but you wouldn't want to do it for longer than a minute, right? It's not a. It feels like that's a sort of hell realm experience to be like locked away in the dark forever. So why don't yeah, the we trend? box has never been an attracting idea to me, or like no, the Matrix no. where the person, the Judas character, plugs yeah. into like the pleasure. Wants to go back. The, yeah, yeah like back. I, I don't know. I, I like pleasure quite a bit. But um, uh, yeah, the meaning in life literature, like coherence is, is really important to me. Like knowing mm -hmm. more of reality, having, if, if like, I was here, kind of, I want to know as far out as I can yeah. in a safe way. And, and yeah. I want to, you know, the idea that I'm just trying to avoid negativity is a, mm -hmm. it's like a scientific fallacy or something that like a lot of theoretic people um paint into that kind of cynical place or whatever but but uh yeah you can't no one would get out of bed if we were just these like pleasure seeking like maximizers or something like that it's so good and you hit the nail right on the head that um it turns out that we're not as uncertainty minimizing machines we're not trying to get no uncertainty rather the right characterization is we are uncertainty minimizing machines right. But that means you need to have uncertainty to minimize. You can't have no uncertainty. Otherwise, we cease to be uncertainty minimizing machines. Okay. So, and what, and it falls right out of like, just think about adaptivity and you hit it dead on. If you're trying to predict the world well so that you can keep yourself in those states that support your life, one of the big problems with getting too small and not looking for new uncertainties to digest and notice that by digest uncertainty, I mean, learn. That's what, how you digest uncertainty. You learn about the world. Then you become more and more fragile because if that, if that pod loses power, if there's a power outage, if there's a hurricane and the pod loses power, if you are highly, 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 highly dependent on that very rigid defined space to be the place where you survive, that ends up being your niche. Then in our kind of changing environment, um, you're in for big trouble. So what actually behooves such a system is that it doesn't try to get no uncertainty, but rather it's always it's always seeking out and increasing its ability to be sensitive to the right kinds of uncertainty to get involved in. So the right kind of learning landscapes to get involved in so that you over time progressively and systematically learn more and more and more about the world which makes you increasingly robust for the kinds of big black swans that come. COVID, pandemics, uh, meteor, uh, 
divorce. I mean, whatever those things are that you just couldn't have predicted was going to be the case. The system that has done lots of learning in its life is going to be the one that's most likely going to be able to navigate those uncertainty landscapes, those really uncertain uncertainty landscapes when they come. So right. So for that kind of system, we don't trend towards a dark room. We, in fact, we trend towards the best slopes. Where can we reduce the most uncertainty? And so I just kick it back to you. So where do you think, where can we find the most uncertainty to manage? Where do we find that? Do you know? Like, where do we find the best slopes of yeah, error resolution? The best, the best uncertainty. Yeah, like where do we find the most uncertainty to resolve? Do you know? Let me think about this. It's, uh -huh. uh, and if you think about it as as a learning landscape, where do we where do we learn the most? Do you know? It's interesting in like an explore exploit kind of mm -hmm. trade off system. That's good. You wanna, you know, you wanna kind of track all the old stuff well, but That's then right. you also want to kind of also track like. I, I study a lot of economics. That's really nice because economics, unlike some other social sciences, is very coupled to reality. Like it doesn't mm. get so abstract sometimes. It has to keep coming back to like, oh, the train didn't get here because of the hurricane. Oh, the the Sea of Beirut is not shipping and stuff like that. So you can't theorize like what would be the most abstract, multi-apt, like uncertain place to stand at. But yeah, there's so well, much already yeah. But you've already got it. You've already got it. That optimal place between explore and exploit, it's right at the edge, right at the edge of your know-how is uh -huh. where the most digestible uncertainty exists because you know, you know, you know the field well enough that you can get your teeth in, but not so well that you're running over old territory again and again and again, and not so far out that you don't have any skills in order to even get into the game to get skin into the game at all. Yeah, so it's yeah. right at the very edge of your abilities. So imagine if you have a system that's trying to predict well, and then you add a layer, you add a layer of complexity where that system is gonna be attracted to and rewarded by um, being sensitive to and finding and leveraging the most uncertainty it can. Yeah. That's gonna be a system that's gonna hang out at its edge. It's gonna to wanna to be at its edge most of the time. Of course, there's gonna be lots of individual differences here. But um, it is going to be a system under optimal constraints is going to want to hang right at its edge because that's where it's going to find the most amount of digestible uncertainty. Um, as soon as we have that in play, um, a, a remarkable thing happens for humans because humans don't only don't only trade in being sensitive to and finding those optimal slopes, but we go out and we make them too. That's the cool thing about being a human, right? We well, literally go better, out yeah, because, and yeah. we make the uncertainty gradients that we're attracted to. So we build roller coasters. We we develop horror movies. We literally uh, games games of all kinds, right? What do you do in order to make a game funner? You you um disable the players in some way. You blindfold them or lift a leg or tie legs together. All we're doing is creating uncertainty at our own edge, so that we can then play at reducing it. Yeah, especially in like a multi-species environment, like in a, if you, it, I don't know, I like, I like how philosophy can kind of get very social and very introspective, mm. but like really the world is so much bigger than our social landscape. And um, yeah, the, the, and we're multi-goal systems. That's another really interesting aspect of like people compared to say like insects which are like very complex and build buildings and things like that but but this this play aspect is a, is a pretty human um yeah that's good so imagine so that, that's a that's a great it's a great way to go actually so um if you're trying to find the most amount of good uncertainty that's uncertainty that you can digest and learn good stuff from um not only will you push yourself to the edge of one particular skill set but for humans who have multiple goal hierarchies, it can also be balancing lots of goals in a, in a sort of novel way. And indeed, over-specialization, the loss of diverse rewarding opportunities, over-siloing of the special sciences and then being locked into a tenured position where you're only doing that one special science, those are actually all ways that you can thwart 
potentially thwart a predictive system that likes to hang at its edge. Um, I like Peter Sterling here. He thinks the reason why we're running into all of the addictive tendencies and problems today, yeah, yeah. one of the reasons is because we've we've sterilized the number of rewarding, meaningful things that we're engaging in. So all that's left is supersizing the few hardwired rewards, um, yeah, yeah. food, sex, social. Um, so if you if you don't have this diversity of opportunities to find lots of kinds of uncertainties, because that's another way we can be at our edge. We don't necessarily have to, you know, uh, free climb El Capitan in order to hit the edge. You can do the edge just oh. by having lots of stuff going on. But as in, you have in less fact, and less we're incredibly stuff psychological on, beings. Like that, we don't have to challenge right. ourselves with nature. It's it's way more interesting to personify a problem into a, a heroic world of horror and then think like how would they get out of it like what if they had the oh, most boring good. job or that's the most good. tough research problem uh -huh. or like i don't know if you remember um captain planet like eco horror and oh, the, idea yeah. the swamp is poisonous and it's destroying humanity and and personifying and anthropomorphizing our our issues or whatever is that's it's so amazing, yeah, because it not only does it like let us use our creativity, but it gives us psychological distance so that we're uh, not as as blind to like what is opaque or whatever. It's, uh... That's really good. So, okay, I, there was a couple of things there that I think are good to pick up on. Um, first, do you like horror movies? Is this something you like? Yeah, I love art and movies. Yeah, I love especially like sci-fi and dystopian, but even like really cheesy, like, yeah, all sorts of movies, yeah. What do you have a favorite? Do you have a favorite horror movie like of, of all time? I was trying something to think about with? that. Probably like horror isn't my favorite genre, so maybe uh -huh. something like Aliens or Predators or. Oh yeah. But I love I love like psychological horror. If you count like uh, Hitchcock and oh yeah, stuff like that, yeah. And then when you go to the movies, do you talk? Do you talk during the movie? No, I'm pretty a pretty. I enjoy the immersion, and in fact, I like yeah, very little talking at, at home. I though, talk. I talk yeah i talk all the time if yeah. i go to i'm the worst person for anybody who's not with me to, to well go that's to a good one to with. break the rule though because horror to me is like it's funny it's a very like right exactly you, you don't have, have and you even don't want to be too immersed because it can be a bit intense right but i love i love zombie films um right. primarily and um just something uh, just picking up on something you said in your last little bit about um uh um when you watch one of these challenging movies, you talk about you talk about what the characters do, or you think through what the characters would do. And this is one of the things that we hypothesized would be attractive for for getting into horror for a predictive system, uh -huh. is it gives you this unique opportunity to run a possible world scenario. Now you might say, "Look, zombies aren't aren't real. Um, that's fine," um, uh, but. Um, big problems that lead to um, like mass mass changes in the environment where you then have to think about survival. You have to think about where's water, where's where's a gun, where can I find safety? Those kinds of things might be real, you know, and they are definitely things that play at the edge of our psyche, at the edge of our psyche. So one of the things that um, I get, I know if I if I if I reflect on why I like zombie movies, one of the things I like is. I get a little bit dedicated time to play um, in an imaginative way with worst case scenarios. Right. And yeah. you see these players on the screen and you watch them as an insider to their emotional psychological lives. And you watch them make decisions in real time. And you might think like, well, nobody would actually act like that. Like horror movies where you're like, nobody would actually do that. But actually, that's fine. One of the reasons why it's alluring for a predictive system like us is because we get the we get the hypothesis test using them as cases where you go, well, I wouldn't do that. I would do this, or that's a stupid thing to do. If things really went bananas, I would do this. Um, and all of that, in a way, can be thought of as as model um, updating, model generation, 100%. because maybe you haven't thought through those ex uh, extreme cases. And maybe they become relevant for you. So now the system is on the lookout for opportunities to check to see um, what would happen in a worst case scenario. And actually there was, um, I don't remember if we got into this paper or not, but there was a New York Times article written about why contagion was so, in, um, was so um, popular during COVID. 
and the uh, author of the article said um it's turned out to be a like um a place that people are turning to figure out how bad it can get so the reason why we're watching the movie is because we're getting some good information about how the world might work or how others might work in the world if the world changed in such a way which i think is a really interesting way to think about media yeah because modeling is hard and modeling using any kind of personification or anthropomorphization or stories allows you to map a lot more into an abstract space than if you were just saying like an X, Y axis or something like that. Being able to say there were 10 people and three of them did this and two did that and one did this and the other ones did that. You're now modeling so much complexity that could totally. really be real and like, uh, if you get rid of like propositional memory and propositional learning and focus right, more people, right. So then the exactly so now the film the yeah. film scaffolds that for you, right? Oh, and if you have a good writer and a good director, then what you're doing is getting a diverse oh, yeah. set of characters, um, some that fail and some that succeed. Oh right, um, and that's what a book should do. It should have like a good example, and then all of these like seven dwarves yeah. that miss the mark over <laughs> and over again in their various yeah, ways. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. It's like the last the last girl phenomenon, right? That in right, I've read lots of this. lots yeah, exactly. of lots of horror movies, there's this trope where where a girl lives through the whole series. I mean, we see it in Scream and Nightmare on Elm Street and the rest. Um, I, I so love then what that, you get the there, yeah. so what you get there, right, is you get you get like exactly in a movie, you get seven test cases of the way you can fail and one test case of how you can succeed. So you're getting a lot of like that didn't work, that didn't work. Oh yeah, that worked. That didn't work. That didn't work. <laughs> Yeah. When you learn more from one mistake sometimes than a thousand successes, and especially it like, yeah, I, I, I studied errors in my uh, master's thesis. So for like two years, I was running teams through these space missions and there was anomalies and errors and stuff. And I was reading all this research on reasoning and error and, um, and wow. anomalies and stuff. So and it, yeah, like error reduction is amazing. The reason we can talk to chat GTP or our phone is because in 1997, the error rate was like 20%, and now it's like 0.001 or something. And that error reduction allows whole new uh, vistas of affordances once they yep. get really, really low. And having Indeed. a 5% error, could you imagine taking a bridge on your way to work if it had a 5% failure rate? No, like, no. oh, it's really no. low. Only 5% no. no. of people die no. on this bridge. No. Like, no. No, so not error reduction is really, really valuable. Yeah, no, I play Dungeons and Dragons, and I've I've rolled I've rolled a one through five lots of times on a on a hundred D roll. <laughs> well, that's perfect, right? Because games are even more immersive than movies, and you that's get true, because... more emotionally attached to your character or to that's what's right. happening in the game. That's right. Than you do in like a bad horror movie, especially, but even in this, like the best ones. Yeah, this is actually at the edge of our of our research too. Is um starting to look at, um, well, th there's two ways that it's branched. Um, there's a, for me personally, there's a less interesting and a more interesting one. The less interesting but relevant for this part of our talk is thinking about, okay, so we, we've thought through some of the movie stuff and, and we haven't talked about that completely. So I wanna come back to that in a second. But one way you might forward the research is to um, look, for instance, at horror video games, especially VR video games, because like you just said, games are more immersive. Why are they more yeah. immersive? One reason is because you are making real behavioral choices that have real outcomes that are scary in the horror genre, right? So you're picking a door. You're picking the door. It's not picked for you. It's not somebody else picking the door. You're doing it. And as soon as you're the agent uh, provoking the horrible outcomes, this ups your skin in the game. This ups your, indeed, it ups your engagement. So VR horror games i think is a really interesting frontier for this research to begin to explore and see if we still find these like wonderful sweet spots there or is it too immersive uh, one of the things we liked about horror movies was we talked about all the ways that you can augment the the amount of uncertainty that you're digesting and you can do it lots of ways so you might think a movie is is pretty passive but actually there's lots of things we do actively when we go to the movie one thing we like peek Right, we literally stop the errors from coming through, and then only let a little air. Right, we only let a little air in, and then we can close it again. We tell people, "Tell me when it's over." Right, I don't want to know. Close your eyes. You close your eyes and go, "Okay, tell me when that's all done." That's you managing uncertainty. 
also things maybe you don't normally think about. You eat candy. You know, you go to the, if you go to a drive-in or you go to the theater, or even if you're at home, you might eat candy. So what you're doing there even is you're like regulating your own metabolism stores, which is going to change how anxious the body is as a, as a starting space. Uh -huh. So if the body already feels like it doesn't have resources, you're more likely to be sensitive to signals that are, you know, trying to inform your system that you need to be doing something like run away or engage or yeah, figure yeah. out. We hold each other's hands. We open and close lights. So that's, that's, I mean, that's all relatively active stuff, but that is not the same as putting on a VR helmet and actually going out and engaging and opening doors. So I suspect, you know, I guess probably that's at the outermost edge of comfort for most people. I like horror movies. I don't think I would love playing Silent Hill in a, in a VR situation. I don't think that would be a great way to spend my day. But, but again, that's a, that's just my personal difference at that edge. Um, two threads quick. I want to back up to one. Why else do you think we're attracted to horror? So we've got, um, you know, you get a chance, you get a chance to like talk through scenarios. You get a chance to get some good information, like starting from this idea that the brain is a prediction engine. Then we also start from the idea that one of the principal things that you're trying to do in the world is trying to figure out how it works so that you can make good predictions. So you're an epistemic engine. You're trying to figure out what's real what, and how does it work. And there's all sorts of like dark and disturbing and morbid things that we wish we had a better model of, but we don't have a lot of opportunities to model it. Like, what is it like to be in a bad car accident? What is it like to be chased? What is it like to be um, in a fire? These are real world things that happen to people and we don't have any way to model it until it's too late. And so we have no way to optimize our our generative model for making predictions about these things. So we might be attracted because there's good information, especially good information about how other people might behave in these kinds of setup scenarios that might be relevant for us. So that's one thing. Is there anything else just intuitively for why you think you like, like let's think aliens. What else do you, what else do you think you get that's positive from going to a startling, like a kind of jump scare, startling movie like aliens? Yeah, no, I, I like, I like thinking about fear because like, I, I think the, the brain is use it or lose it or, or like our whole essence, mm. our whole being is use it or lose it. Like the, there's a um, paper I love about um, the myth of the given and a lot of like abstract kind of uh, dualists think they can kind of abstract out of reality. And then like the more Gibsonian view is or, or Neoplatonic view is that we're participating and we only know through participation and we're mm. dialectic in nature, not monologic. And so mm. a participatory being could almost lose touch with their um, essences if they don't use them sometimes. Like you could atrophy your muscles. If you're too good at information processing, I'm crushing the researchers or my blog is on fire and my literal like stomach can't break down food because i'm atrophying like all my my intestines and stuff like that so it's robert it's, it's uh, really it's hard. really good bud so that was the last point i wanted to hit so it's so good yeah. that you just get it into it early right. yeah. so the last piece of the puzzle we thought was something special you get from going to a horror movie is you get to have the body respond as if it's in these kinds of conditions in a relatively safe environment so in a safe controllable environment you get to have feelings of anxiety being under pressure feeling afraid and why would it be valuable to run those things well because they're things that we are inevitably actually going to go through in the real world so that's where you're talking about overly abstractions cause us to be precariously brittle so these are real experiences that we tend to have and it turns out that in in, in addition to modeling the world modeling dynamics out in the world in order to make good predictions. That a key element of what we're trying to model is ourselves in the world. We're trying to figure out what it's like to be us in this world. And the better the model we have about how me and the world fit together, the better I'm gonna be at making long distance decisions that are likely to improve that relationship between me and the world. I am a key feature. But for that to be modeled, I actually have to have those experiences. I have to go through the opportunities so that I get a chance to model what it's like. I have to be scared enough that my system learns what, for instance, that anxiety and fear tend to 
rise and fall. We're not scared and then scared forever. You just don't have the neuroregulatory chemicals for that to take place. You don't have the peptide stores. You have a finite number of like biological resources that ground feelings of anxiety and fear. If you feel like you're anxious all the time, it's because you're pinging anxiety over and over and over again. One example, one experience or event of fear or anxiety has this crescendo. It goes up and then it comes down. Right. If you don't have enough experiences, if you don't have yeah. enough exposure to feeling bad, then yeah. when you feel a little bit bad, you freak out because you don't have any model for, oh yeah, I felt way worse than this. I felt way worse than this and it passes. It passes in a couple of hours. No big deal. I've had panic attacks. I've had massive panic attacks. I've been in like a really tough situation before. It always comes to an end. Those people have much better opportunities and indeed more resilience. And what that resilience actually is, is their system it already knows through multiple exposures what the likely trajectory of this fear-related stimuli is going to be like. And so it can chill right out. This is like if you're, I've said this before, but I think it's a good example. If you're afraid of flying, the worst thing in the world is having pilots who go, we're about to hit some turbulence. For how long? Forever? You know, like I don't have any model for how this is going to go. Best pilots are the ones who go, we're about to have light turbulence for the next six minutes. Uh, hold on tight and I'll let you know when we're through it. Then you think like six minutes, God, I mean, I can, I can stand six minutes. I can't, six hours would be problematic for me. Six minutes, I've got. There's the difference in your tone, a feeling tone when you have a model of how it goes versus you don't have a model of how it goes. So it actually behooves us as embodied living prediction systems to have a bunch of challenging experiences so that we can model them, so that we can learn about them, so that we can better adapt relative to them. And uh, what a what a cool thing. I mean, we're just, about, you know, tomorrow's Halloween. So it's so cool that we're getting this talk in today. I hope we can, we should drop it tomorrow if you can. It'd be great to drop it on Halloween because here's at least one good reason to go to a horror film. You're going to fill out your generative model. You're going to get to play through thinking about worst case scenarios. That can be fun. And you're going to get a chance to be in some of these absolutely essential, can't be missed, challenging experiences of being a human and get a chance to model them, know them, and better adapt to them in the future. I mean, what a great thing to do on a date night at least once a year. Yeah, no, I think, I think um, again, like use it or lose it. I think it's so... Um... We're, we're in almost the worst time. It's really um, so easy not to use so much of our humanity and just be like very good Gosh. at the economy instead of Gosh. this depth of being. And um, what, one yeah. big problem with the internet, right? You can right. go out and find find any community to soothe your belief structures without mm. being without being impacted in a sort of negative way. I mean, we really can find if you believe the earth is flat, you don't have to deal with no. um, a lot of like counter evidence. You can just go to all the flat earther conferences and get involved in all the, all the filter bubbles. Um, well, in and fact, that's actually I think not the algorithms healthy. Want that. Yeah. I think the algorithms want us to complacently be like, Oh, I'm a, I'm a, this kind of person. And I only consume that kind of content. And like when I'm not consuming content, I drink Mountain Dew and I go to Disney World or whatever. And just like I, I watch sometimes in the morning, sometimes I'll read just like the Tao Te Ching and Akira Kurosawa's autobiography. And other days I just watch garbage internet, like news feeds and stuff like that. And I go, okay, well, at least I have an idea of what's going on in the world and it's a little funny to me or whatever. But it's... um. Yeah, it's so easy to just get into whatever you're into. And yeah. um, if you, and you forget, like I, I love fiction and sci-fi and you talked about Dungeons and Dragons and, and um, you really, it, it's hard for people to model the inner worlds of others without fiction of some sort. And we used to, yeah. like I was researching a little for this and really every culture has myths involving fear. You can't find a culture that doesn't have like a movie, like their movies involve like God and Satan and like the monkey King and horrible, horrible things. But like they were always, there's a lot of fear in every culture. And the idea that um, like part of your path of maturity is encountering scary things. And in fact, yeah. like 
I don't know how much you read Jungian stuff, but like yeah. going towards your fear is yeah. one of the most like predictably liberating um, adult things to do, I guess. Yeah. I heard um, Jordan Peterson said something in a psychology class that I took with him at UFT um, back in early 2000s that has stuck around in me, bangs around. And I think about it all the time, actually. He said, um, one of the things that we lost um, when we stopped having initiations, right, rites of initiation, was we lost the opportunity as a culture to calibrate our young men and women to what real difficulty looks like. So if you look at, if you look at cultures where they have rites of passage, or you look at ancient rites of passage, especially the like scary ones, you know, the like go out and live in the woods by yourself without your tribe for a minute, or, um, you know, um, like go and be hung from a tree by these hooks until you fall sort of spontaneously or go out with no food and water for like a time. Um, not to be too reductivist because there's lots of beautiful things, powerful things, um, challenging things that can happen in those kinds of situations. But at least one that's interesting for our conversation today is, is any, uh, at a young age, especially when you're still f in that formative phase, you've got lots of neuroplasticity. And then you're getting a big dose of how bad it can get would have an effect on a predictive system like us that it would recalibrate the way that we think about every other kind of error that we encounter. So what is somebody saying something rude to you online? Wh where does that fit with being hung by hooks for three days and three nights? Like they are not in the same ballpark of experiences and the one is really really hard right but think about the bang on positive effects for the rest of your life you'd be like yeah well i mean it was a bad day but i mean it wasn't that bad of a day <laughs> no 100 percent because both, like, oh, both work was hard aspects. today yeah but it, yeah but i mean it wasn't being alone in the desert for like a hundred hours it wasn't bad like that <laughs> that's one of the, the easiest ways to be happy is just be miserable for a couple of days and go back to oh. your normal life like, oh, wait, I, I, I'm living in the 21st century next to this is wonderful. And with cars this, and, this, like, no, this I, is I wonderful. This it, is wonderful. It's doubly cathartic, really. Yeah. So I just I just had um, um I'm teaching a class right now at UFT um, uh, called um, the Art and Science of Flourishing. And okay. um, we were just talking about, um, you know, the the burst in research looking at especially Buddhist monastic brains with EEG or fMRI. And how we have this big burst in, in interest in contemplative studies because we have this massive population of contemplatives and we get increasingly refined brain scanning stuff. And when you put those together, you get this really interesting mix. You get people who can actually put their minds where you tell them to put them. And then we've got brain scanning stuff so we can see what's going on under the hood. And, um, you know, a remarkable outcome is, I mean, maybe not remarkable sort of layman terms, but it is remarkable for us in, in the lab is that these monastics have, they're like off the charts for all the indicators of flourishing and well-being and happiness. But when you actually dig into what the practice is like, it looks like that they focus every day so much on the suffering, the inevitable suffering and permanent nature of human existence. So uh, depression has this rumination element um, where you want to reduce the rumination on the negative in order to reduce the tendencies of depression. But for yeah. monastics and contemplatives, thinking about suffering a lot actually leads to these really radical positive um, outcomes. I mean, there's a subtle story to be told there, but I love the idea that updating your model to better reflect the real world regularities. So like, if this is getting a bit abstract, let me bring it down. No, this is good. Yeah. So if you are upset today because your haircut was bad, like, let's say really upset. Okay. One of the things that might be going on is you're, you're over, you're overlooking the fact that you have potable water and healthy food and like any measure of freedom, healthcare. It, like, it's amazing. So, like, so if you, because in... if that was, because if that was up front, the haircut would be very, very, very small. So, and, and just, okay. I want to just take it one step further. Why isn't it why isn't it so obvious up front how miraculous it is to have potable water? One of the reasons is because we don't have a generative model. 
our model is not mapping the real world conditions. The real world conditions are this. Many, 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 many people do not have clean water with easy access. Many people don't have healthy, nutritious food whenever they want it. Many people do not have freedom. Many people are much sicker than you are. And if you are, if your model isn't tracking, I mean, that might sound a little bit depressing, but if your model isn't tracking that those are real world dynamics, then when you do better than expected, when your conditions are the top 001% on earth, you don't notice them because your model isn't reflecting the importance of those things. So, so the end, so in conclusion, if you want to be more sensitive to the things that you're grateful for, it helps a predictive system in order to model how it actually is here, including how painful and challenging it can be. Yeah, the, 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 it's important. Yeah. Pain is a funny one because you, uh, uh, it, it, you a priori don't know your limits of pain, but if you want to grow, you need to encounter pain. And so oh, yeah. it's a very tricky dynamic to kind of uh, oscillate with. And then like, we're like a, a again, we're multi-goal. We're, we're not really good at predicting our emotional states in the future or in context, even that we're very familiar in. Um, like these patterns, you can have like these horrible family patterns every Christmas that happen. It's like, mm. you think like, after year six, people go, like, Aporia, we're not doing any of this anymore. But we're really <laughs> bad at, at like anticipating and preparing and all this kind of stuff. And, no, it's, it's, I think it's, and play is awesome. Play, especially in like a work culture, which you kind of have to be able to uh, delay your gratification to produce large language models and universities and highway mm. systems and high speed rails and stuff. But if you, you lose track of like the ability to be afraid or to, to have laughter or yeah, all of that becomes super secondary. And especially I mean, now we talk about this a lot, but, but we have, you know, a salient system and it's constantly in this like social world and getting it back into kind of a more existential um, yeah. alignment. That's maybe a little more broader than whatever our social roles are or, or things like that. It's uh, it, like, like it feels, death or suffering or um, given everything you just said, which I think is like such a lovely crown on our conversation. Cause we're back right now to the practical edge. Yeah, yeah. I think we could do much worse than like, you know, like starting a, a like a ultimate tag team with other adults in your hometown where you're out like running after and running away from other people would be so healthy. Um, Taking a gap year from university, like between high school and university or university and work and going out and getting in touch with some of the real world dynamics, like don't just stay at resorts, but actually go out and live with people around the world. And, um, and I had one other one too. Um, and, uh, and serving in your community service is such an awesome way of helping the model work right because you're in if if you if you are dedicating a little bit of your life to service you are inevitably going to come into contact with people that are that are suffering and that are challenged because that's where the service happens which is um completely beneficial for our kind of system to see that there is real challenge and and even more to learn that there's things that you can do relative to that challenge is such an empowering such a great way to update the model and to empower a generative model like ours. So yeah, so like uh, adult tag travel and uh, you know get involved with service in your community are all really beneficial things. Yeah, it's I, I, well being and meaning in life are so interesting and and um, uh, service too. It's it's great because you really, whenever you are in a service place you're outside of where you're comfortable, like your whatever your comfort zone is, it's kept you away from that. And then when you put That's yourself good. in that, you go like, oh, I forgot humanity thinks this way or deals with this or oh, it's good. like that. So I, it's yeah, good. I, I love I love that. I love that because right away what you do there is you just, you just like remind us that the same reasons we might be attracted to horror is another reason why getting involved in a service space might also be beneficial pushes you outside of your limits 
it makes sure that you have challenging feelings that you have to learn to digest. You have to grow up and clean up and wake up relative to those feelings. Uh, you're learning about what it's like somewhere else outside of your little filter bubble. Um, yeah, yeah. That's all such good stuff. Um, so there's a good example where having the right kinds of goals also matters for our kind of system flourishing. So for instance, if if your only goal is to be comfortable, it's not a great goal. Or your only goal is to make money, which isn't a great goal. But having a goal like um, learning what it's like to be human or having a goal of being wise and compassionate, having a goal of being... Um, you know, a good servant in your, in your community. These are really good goals for lots of reasons. And actually that's where our research is um, headed now. So we're taking a lot of this fun sort of sexy, you know, we've got, we've gotten a little bit of play here, you know, it's, uh, it turns out that it's, you know, people want to talk to you when you write a paper that says violent video games and horror movies are good for your mental health. Uh, Cause it's kind of sexy, it's sexy in the right ways, you know? Um, but um the really interesting way that the research is going now. And I told you there was a fork in the road. One would be towards something like VR horror games, which I think it's probably not going to be me. I think it's an interesting research agenda. I don't think I'll be the one doing it. I think it is really interesting and it is a great frontier. Other way to go though, and the way that I'm going, is to take everything that we think is beneficial from going to a horror movie and start thinking about, well, where are the other places where we generate those same benefits right. without having to go to, you know, Rob Zombie's sort of twisted view of reality, because actually there's all sorts of stuff in horror movies that I don't want to take on board in order to get well, uh, like Rob Zombie, you know, like I just like walked out of his oh, no. movie. It was the last time I ever went to one of his movies. It was so horrible. It was so horrible. It wasn't just like, and I don't mean horribly, like badly made. I mean, it's, it's an, I mean, it's, an, it's excellent for what it is. But the content was so disturbing that I could feel yeah. my I could feel my mind being like, oh, like I don't think I need that in my memory. Thanks so much. Um, so what in particular we're looking at is, um, especially in the contemplative spaces. So uh, you know the Stoics, the Buddhists, the Christians, among many others, have have a core place in their practice ideologies, which is the benefit of reflecting on your own death the benefit of reflecting on injury, suffering, old age, the benefit of reflecting on how challenging it is. Um, and lo and behold, um, meditating imaginatively on your own dying process, on the death process, um, and on the death and dying process of your loved ones would have all of the same positive effects that going to a horror movie would have, except for without the dross and with, and with the wisdom turned maximally up you know, because it's getting your model to be really, really close to the real world thing in some really special ways that we don't tend to, we don't tend to, I think, appreciate or put enough time into. We really, we are uh, ultra fascinated by death. And at the same time, we um, occlude it as much as possible in our culture. You know, we don't want to see- we should, we should be very upfront that we are horrible at yeah. looking at ugly things. Like when John Ravicki talks about like the smooth- and Gunshul Han's like, we're so bad. I live in Florida and like no one talks about elderly. Like it's tragic. Like these old people, they're so alone. They're, they they don't have any way to process these feelings. I had a friend I used to read Plato with and he would uh, do a palliative care and go into people's homes. And like, it's the saddest thing because um, like anyone, if you're in, at all into Jungian, you talked about Peterson, like we have dreams when we're near death that will grab our attention and say, get ready for this next thing. Don't look the other direction. And when people embrace that, they have such inner peace. They, they actually do transcend that fear of death and that fear of like, oh my gosh, there's a role I've never thought about that I'm about to participate in. And it's, and it's, not, uh, and it's yeah. not totally fantastic to think that we could get to the bottom of the benefits of being in touch with challenging spaces like 100%. death and dying old age and to actually start implementing some of those things, if not sort of nationally, at least individualistically, um, like, uh, you know, encouraging your kids to work in hospice for a season, yeah, and, yeah. you know, take, taking the opportunity to get comfortable and see what it's like to work um, with people who are in extreme lonely situations. Those are completely fantastical outcomes. So I would love to see, um, and maybe uh, the next time we talk, because this was so nice, um, maybe the next time we talk, 
we can um, we can kind of do a part two here and start looking at some of the some of the expansion of this research into this contemplative realm, um, yeah. which I think is really exciting, and I'm I'm excited to be on it. Yeah, no, I love the the tetrapharmacon. If you know that, I've done that dozens of times, and I've done the Buddhist death meditation, and like imagine like okay, well, what if I'm a body, and then I'm like a cool body, and then my bones are gelatinizing, then I'm a pool, and uh, yeah, other people's it. death me is like ten times harder than my own death. Like I'll never know my own death, and I'm not too worried about it. And if there's a giant Egyptian god that judges me and throws me to hell, or if there's like the best candy in the universe, I don't like that. Doesn't worry me as much as like the 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 things worse than death, like being chased by a dinosaur or losing a loved one, or um, yeah, the, the kind of psychological. Yeah stuff much more than the physiological although yeah. the physiological we could have got it into and like mold and all sorts of things are kind of terrifying to think about mm. um but yeah this is let's been do it awesome. Let, let's do it next time let's do it next time i've loved being on well awesome yeah well, well i love philosophy and science and creativity so you're right in my spot and so i'll, I'll reach it, out a little bit and, uh, great let's do it again